This lecture is about gene expression, specifically the first step of gene expression called transcription. Transcription has three basic stages. Um, they're very simple, initiation, elongation, and termination stages. Uh, there are lots of things going on in each of those stages, but we're going to talk just about the very basics of what's happening during each of them. This is the first stage of gene expression, and what is happening is DNA sequence is being read and RNA is being made using the DNA sequence as a template. The main actor in transcription that we're going to discuss is called RNA polymerase. So remember, poly means many, mer means part, and ace means enzyme. So an RNA polymerase is going to be an enzyme that makes RNA polymers. It's just like DNA polymerase, which did DNA replication, but now it's RNA polymerase making RNA. RNA polymerase is able to pry apart the DNA or to initiate transcription. It doesn't need a primer, so that's different than DNA polymerase, but it doesn't need a primer, and so it can just start adding RNA nucleotides um, to build an RNA strand. Just like DNA polymerase, it can only elongate um, in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So that means it can only add to the free 3' prime end of the RNA strand. And remember that the 3' prime, 5' prime just indicates what part of the um, sugar we're talking about here. So the 3' prime end has a hydroxyl group on it, that's the 3' prime, and then the 5' prime end has the phosphate group, and this is in a big, long sugar. Uh, this is um, ribose, so it'll have another hydroxyl group here because it's going to be RNA, and then out here is the ATCG, or excuse me, the AUCG, in this case, for the RNA. Um, so the new nucleotides can get only added onto the 3' prime end, onto that hydroxyl group. And so that's why it has to build from the phosphate containing 5' prime and add on on the 3' prime to build this little RNA strand. These are representing RNA nucleotides. And at the end would be a free 3' prime hydroxyl group. So that's the 3' prime, and that's the 5' prime end of the RNA strand. So usually I draw something like this, single-stranded, and that would be the phosphate-containing side here and the hydroxyl side there. So RNA polymerase can only jump on this hydroxyl side and add on to that. Uh, it uses the same base pairing rules that DNA polymerase did for the most part, uh, except for in RNA, if you recall, there's no thymine. There's uracil instead. So for RNA, the DNA, RNA, so when the DNA has an A, RNA puts in U, or to build the RNA, it's a U, the RNA polymerase. When DNA has a T, it's an A, just like before, and then when DNA has a C, it's a G, and a G, it's a C. And so that's how the RNA is going to be built in a specific order, um, based off the DNA order. There's a special sequence to tell the RNA polymerase where to start. Uh, it's called a promoter region. So the promoter, um, we'll see a picture of it in a minute, uh, it is the marker of the start of the gene. So, you know, the DNA is quite a long molecule. There are many um, multiple molecules of DNA in a cell, and so each gene is marked by a promoter region, which is a specific sequence before it, so that RNA polymerase knows where to transcribe. So here's the basic um, graphic of transcription. This is your RNA polymerase. Here's that promoter region we were talking about that tells RNA polymerase where to start. And then a specific start point here, which is a particular sequence that the RNA nucleotides start getting added at. So RNA polymerase pulls open the DNA, unwinds it, and then starts adding RNA nucleotides. So this is the initiation, the opening, and adding the very beginning of the um, RNA nucleotides. Then we have elongation, so the RNA polymerase zips along the DNA, and uh, it's building RNA as it does that. You can see it's only adding onto the 3' prime end, so you always know the part that's hanging out is the 5', prime, and the part that's being built is the 3 prime. So wherever the polymerase, the RNA polymerase is sitting, must be the 3 prime end. You'll also notice that it's um, anti-parallel, uh, complementary to the ends of the DNA. So the 5 prime here matches the 3 prime there, 
and the three prime here is the opposite of the five prime there. And that's because we're using the bottom strand as the template in this case. Some genes use the bottom strand, some genes use the top strand. For any gene, it's gonna always be the same strand, but different genes use different strands. But it'll always add on to the three prime side. Then we get to termination. There's a sequence um, downstream of the promoter and the gene, so it's the end of the gene. It causes the RNA polymerase to fall off in the case of prokaryotes and to fall off soon thereafter in the case of eukaryotes, and basically you end up having what we call an RNA transcript. In prokaryotes, we call it the transcript. In eukaryotes, we call it the pre-mRNA at this point. And then uh, that means your gene has been transcribed. Here's a close-up of the base pairing rules, same as before. Um, but you'll notice that we don't open the DNA up all the way. It's just a little bubble that closes behind itself uh, when the RNA polymerase goes through. The so the RNA is single-stranded and it's hanging out um, between the double helix. So you see the base pairing rules. You had a T in the DNA, you put an A in for the mRNA. Uh, you had an A in the DNA, you put a U in for the RNA. So any times you see a sequence with U's, you know that's an RNA sequence. And any time you see a sequence with T's, you know that's a DNA sequence. And then the RNA polymerase, based off of shape and hydrogen bonding ability, would um, match the A's and T's and C's and G's and U's and A's, etc. And so that's how you build the strand. So this is the elongation step of transcription. We have some terminology. So the promoter and then the direction of gene um, expression. So anything that is the RNA polymerase moves towards, so it's, we call it downstream. So it's towards the end of the, the gene is downstream. Towards the beginning of the gene is upstream. So that's just some terminology. If we had a regulatory region, we might have some upstream regulatory region that's before the gene um, or a downstream regulatory region, something like that. You'll also notice the five prime is the free and like I said before, and the three prime is the end what's getting built on. So if I gave you a picture of something like this, you should be able to label all the parts and know the five primes and three primes um, based off of positioning of the different molecules. Termination in bacteria, there's a specific sequence called the terminator that the RNA polymerase gets to and it causes it to fall off of the DNA. So then the transcription's done. In eukaryotes, there is um, a sequence called the polyadenylation sequence. So basically what that means is that um, it's coding for many adenines to be added on. That's going to be the end of the mRNA and the RNA polymerase uh, eventually falls off once it's past that sequence. All this transcription has to be regulated. And so um, we've seen, for the most part, regulation like this. This is all negative feedback. But we've seen where a molecule can go back and feed back into its loop and stop the um, functioning of enzyme 1. We'll say that tryptophan comes back, it binds enzyme 1, and prevents this step in the pathway from happening. So that's one way to do feedback inhibition. We also have um, negative feedback for uh, gene expression. So this is to actually shut off the production of one of these um, enzymes. So it shuts down the gene expression, which actually makes, means that you don't make enzyme 2 anymore, or 3, or 1. So this is a, a slower way to slow down gene expression um, or enzyme function. This is much faster. It can uh, come back on faster too when there's not any enzyme being bound by tryptophan. But if we want long-term shutting down or turning on, then you can regulate the actual gene expression. In prokaryotes, like bacteria particularly, we know a lot about, bacteria use um, what we call operons for coordinating their gene expression. So there are three genes in this picture, A, B, and C gene, and each of those codes for a different polypeptide. The polypeptides may be functional proteins on their own, or they may be subunits that come together to make a single protein. 
In any case, almost always the A, B, and C are going to be doing some function together, like processing lactose, the sugar. So what um, bacteria have their setup is they have their promoter, the whole region, and here's the part the RNA polymerase sits on, and then we have a part called the operator. And the operator is the segment of the promoter that's going to either allow RNA polymerase to move, or it's going to block RNA polymerase from going forward, depending on what's bound to it. And so if it's blocked, then the genes don't get expressed. They don't get transcribed into RNA. If it's open, then it does allow the polymerase to go across and um, transcribe the RNA, which then is translated into proteins. You'll also notice that there is only one transcript that is made for all three genes, and then when the um, ribosome is translating to make the polypeptides, it has specific sequences here that tell it where the start and stop of each of those genes is. So we're not going to talk in detail about these operons, but I do want you to notice that the single promoter is controlling the expression of genes that are involved in a similar process, maybe multiple steps of the same kind of process. So here's one example. In this example, it's called a repressible operon. That's why we have a repressor involved. So most of the time, the genes ex are expressed until there is enough product, let's say. So this product amount indicates that the genes do not need to be expressed any longer. It would be a waste of energy to do that because there's plenty of product. So in this case, that product activates the repressor, it binds the operon, and physically blocks the RNA polymerase from accessing the genes. It can't go through and transcribe them. So that represses the gene expression when there's enough product. It's negative um, operon, and that one is repressible. Then we have operons that are called inducible operons. It's still repression, but it's the opposite where the gene is usually, the gene expression is usually being repressed because of the bound repressor. But now when there's a product present, it binds it and unbinds the operator. So most of the time the genes are off until there's a certain product available, then the genes get turned on. So that's inducible. And then we have the stimulatory positive regulation of gene expression. So this would be when RNA polymerase is um, helped helps the binding of it with a stimula stimulatory protein. So the protein gets activated, binds the promoter region that allows RNA polymerase to bind better, and so you get more transcription of the genes. So there's a combination of, of positive regulation and negative regulation and undoing negative regulation that results in bacterial operons being expressed or not. And most of this is energetically favorable, that's what it goes towards. So if you have product you need to work on, then the genes are expressed. If that's not there, the genes are not expressed. Um, when there's product, they're stimulated. When there's not, they're not. And so it's, it's very coordinated to the environment. In eukaryotes, gene expression has a lot more levels of uh, control. And so we're going to go through some of those levels starting all the way back at the DNA level. So here's your DNA double helix. We've talked about before how it's coiled up into a cell, six feet of DNA in each cell nucleus. Um, and how that happens are these proteins that are called histones. The DNA wraps around those histones, then it wraps around itself and wraps around itself until um, at least in, um, during mitosis or meiosis, it's condensed into a chromosome. But even when it's not, it's still in this chromatin structure. Chromatin is the DNA plus the protein together. And that's how it fits in a cell. So we can actually adjust how coiled up the DNA is in order to uh, control gene expression. So if the DNA is kind of open, then the RNA polymerase can access it and transcribe genes. If the DNA is very closed, like it's coiled up tightly, the RNA polymerase can't get in there to access the gene, so that gene will stay off. And so regulating that coiling is what allows us to um, regulate gene expression just from the DNA structure itself. And that is called epigenetics. Epigenetics is the regulation of the 
coiling or uncoiling of the DNA um, in order to regulate gene expression. So you need to watch this video about DNA packing so you can see it wrapping around the histones and all that stuff and the chromatin and what that is. I can't play it on here and record it. It won't record in a browser window, but I do have it linked to um, or embedded on the uh, page that you found this lecture on. We actually know that the structure of DNA can be changed by the environment now. That's the epigenome is the second layer of uh, regulation on the gene. So it's, the sequence is important for what you know alleles you have. But then for the gene expression regulation, there are markers that are on both the histones, that's what you're seeing here, the little green balls. Uh, there's also markers on the DNA itself. And those different types of markers, for example, here, they're ac acetyl groups. They're... Um, they help open up or there's different markers that close the DNA. So methylation is what happens to DNA a lot. Um, and so that means that the DNA is going to be um, uh, non-accessible versus acetylation here with the histones. That means the DNA is accessible. But basically what you need to know is those modifying groups can promote the DNA to open up or to stay closed or to close more. Uh, environment like diet, stress, exercise, smoking, all that kind of stuff can actually influence the um, epigenetic state of your DNA and so that changes gene expression. We also know now that the your epigenome can get passed on to your children. So part of it is in the womb, the diet the, and the smoking and the exercise and stress level of the mother affects the um, growing offsprings methylation and acetylation and so that can change gene expression forever in the child even though the DNA is unchanged sequence wise there's no mutation there's also um, passing down through generations and so it's not like the fathers don't do this either um, we don't really totally understand how that happens but it seems to go at least three generations down certain types of stressors in the past um, keep showing up in the genome of the grandchildren. Um, but even when the grandchild's not exposed to the same stressors. So you can see that it actually matters what you do for your child children's health directly in regulating their gene expression of their DNA. I have a number of videos I want you to watch for this. They're linked to on um, or embedded on the page where you found this lecture. I just can't play them within the window because the program won't record them. So that was regulating on the DNA level as far as packing goes. Now we can regulate um, as far as the transcription goes, the initiation step of it, the very first step. So in eukaryotes, besides just having the RNA polymerase, you actually also need other proteins called transcription factors. There are general transcription factors and specific transcription factors, but you need a, a number of them, the right ones, to come together. They bind a specific spot on the promoter, and that's going to help the RNA polymerase bind. So without those transcription factors, the RNA polymerase doesn't bind the promoter. And so the way you can control gene expression is either have the transcription factors present or don't have them present. If they're present, you're going to get transcription of the gene. If they're not present, then you won't. So here are some transcription factors. So sometimes they bind to the promoter. Um, but there are also other ones that can bind far away from the gene. Um, these are, in this case, activators, and this is the enhancer sequence. In any case, what's happening here is that these guys binding are going to actually promote gene expression. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Here's a picture of a transcription factor. It's um, protein shape. This one is specifically MyoD, which is important for muscle cell development. And so it binds the DNA and that is going to promote RNA binding and RNA polymerase binding, and that promotes gene expression. But the MyoD would only be present in cells that are going to turn into muscle. And that's how you get different cells turning into different cell types in uh, the developing organism. So here's a picture of how those transcription factors that are far away can help promote gene expression. You can see the DNA actually bends around when those transcription factor activators are bound. They help bind other um, mediator proteins, which help bind general transcription factors. And so you get this complex that promotes RNA polymerase binding, and then that would promote RNA synthesis um, and transcription. 
And why uh, would this, like I said, it allows certain cells to become certain cell types. And once they're certain cell types, it allows those cells to do particular functions. So here's a liver cell versus a lens cell in the eye. The DNA is the same in every cell of your body, except for your gametes. But every other cell has exactly the same DNA, barring a mutation in a somatic cell. But um, the DNA is regulated differently. So in some cells, there are red, yellow, and gray transcription factors available. So they're being transcribed by other genes in that cell. When those bind this enhancer region, it turns on the albumin gene, which makes the cell act like a liver cell. So the albumin gene is important. Albumin is important for liver cell function. It does not bind. You'll see it has one binding of the promoter for crystalline gene, but not enough. So crystalline doesn't get expressed, even though it's present in the liver cell. The opposite happens in a lens cell. So crystalline is a protein that needs to be expressed in order to build the lens. And so when those transcription factors are present, the activators, they're going to promote crystalline expression, but you'll notice there's not the right combination to promote albumin expression. So even though both genes are present in both cell types, only some of them are on, and that depends on what transcription factors you have present. I also might mention that um, you might be like, well, how do you initially get the transcription factors present? Well, even in the maternal um, egg, in the egg of the mother, there are certain transcription factors deposited in different places, and so those are the initial activators of other transcription factors. Um, which give you certain cell types. So here's an example of this master regulatory gene, MyoD, which is um, present in the embryonic precursor cell. So this cell has no identity yet. And we, it's going to, it's in the part of the body that's going to turn into a muscle cell. So in order for that to happen, the MyoD gene gets turned on. Now, sometimes, and usually in this case, it would be from either a signal from another cell neighboring it or some kind of maternal deposit in the cell that turns on the uh, transcription factor or the transcription factor for MyOD is there. So let's look at this. So MyOD starts getting expressed and it makes the MyOD transcription factor. Now the um, cell is called a myoblast. It's on its path to becoming a muscle cell. We call that being determined. So it won't become a muscle cell yet, but um, it's already down that path. Um, so then the MyoD can go and bind other muscle-specific genes, bind those promoters, and act as a transcription factor to turn those genes on. So now you see the MyoD has bound to the pink gene promoter, and that makes a different transcription factor. In this case, that transcription factor binds both the orange gene and the yellow gene and makes them transcribed, and they make actual proteins that build the muscle cell. So now what's muscle is what we call differentiated, which means that it is specific for a function and has particular structure for that cell type. So it would be a muscle cell in this case. And you can see how um, even MyoD comes back and turns itself on more. And so you have this cascade um, kind of like a relay, turning more genes on and more genes on, and each one can activate additional genes, and so you end up getting a very specific signature of muscle cell. Muscle cell makes myosin and actin and cell cycle blocking proteins, and all those cause the cell to be a muscle cell. When we are looking at transcription, look at the mRNA, we can... Uh, visualize and quantify how much mRNA of what type is being made. And this is useful because you can see which genes are on and which genes are off, how much that gene is on or off. You can compare different tissue types and see how the gene is expressed differently or the same. And you can see where the genes are expressed, um, at least to the transcription level. So one thing to show where and when the genes are expressed is called in situ hybridization. So let's look at that first. So here's an example of in C2 hybridization. And the idea here, so this is an embryo. This is um, a Drosophila fruit fly embryo. And they fluorescently label probes. So a probe means a complementary sequence to what you're interested in seeing. 
So if you, the gene or the mRNA you're interested in seeing, you know it sequences A, U, C, C, G. You'd make a probe probably of DNA because it's more stable. That would have the complement. And then on that probe, you would add some sort of tag, let's say a red fluorescent tag. So everywhere that you saw your mRNA, everywhere the mRNA is located, the probe binds, it carries along with it fluorescence, and then you see all the red means that gene is being expressed in that region. You have a different probe to a different sequence, a different mRNA, which binds um, and has a yellow fluorescent tag on it. So you can see in this case that that yellow gene is being expressed only on the one side of each stripe versus the blue gene is expressed on the right. Now these are not actually colored genes, but um, they're just tagged so we can see where the genes are expressed. We also don't have to have fluorescent probes for in situ hybridization. Um, there are other ones, and you can just see here, these are early mouse embryos developing, is uh, we can stain for um, different gene expression in different mutants. So here's a wild type mouse, and you can see where the genes are being expressed. The gene of interest, is, we're looking at RAC1. And when you look at, actually, I take that back. We're looking at Sonic Hedgehog. So in the RAC1 mutant, you see that obviously the shape of the um, mutant is not correct, but you can also see the gene expression is totally different. Uh, something like that you can see here as well. So here's the wild type embryo. Um, the FOXA2 is a different gene, and in the wild type it's expressed all in this region, but in the RAC1 mutant, you can see it's kind of chopped up and uh, there's lacking expression in those regions. So that would help you understand what the what RAC1 might be useful for or doing. Obviously, it's something with FOXA2 expression, and so that can help you understand what's going on in development or some you know, development of cancer or any kind of process that you're interested in. You can also be more quantitative. You know, notice before we could sort of tell levels, but it was not. We don't have any numbers particularly, uh, and so. What you can do is you just harvest all the mRNA from a cell of interest. RNA is easily broken down, so you turn it into DNA. Kind of cool, you use um, reverse transcriptase, which I don't know if you recall, but um, retroviruses like HIV, they have reverse transcriptase in um, their genome, small, small genome. And reverse transcriptase can read RNA and build DNA, which is very unusual, usually most um, enzymes can only do the opposite. So what we've done is we um, make our own RNA, or reverse transcriptase, and then make DNA from the RNA. Now it's a stable, but it's the same sequence as the RNA. And we're gonna see how much we have of that um, from whatever cell you harvested. So here's your mRNA. You did um, reverse transcription to turn it into DNAs. We call them C. DNAs, complementary DNAs. Same sequence as the mRNA, just in DNA nucleotides. Then we're going to PCR amplify because there's not enough of the cDNA. So you just make tons and tons of copies of whatever gene you're interested in in the mRNA. And then you can run it on a gel just to look at the bands and you can see, depending on the thickness of the band, like at stage one here, you see none of that mRNA being expressed. Uh, you have a little bit at stage two, and then stage three through six pretty much have the same higher level of the mRNA being expressed. So you know that the gene turns on somewhere between stage one and two, and then it really ramps up when you get to stage three and stays on through stage six of development. DNA microarrays are also very useful. They're a kind of way we get a lot of information through a pretty simple procedure. So here's what we call a gene chip. It's pretty small, here's a matchstick. And on that gene chip, in this case, it's the entire human genome. And this is a mouse genome. And uh, there's um, spots, so each, there's tons and tons of spots here. And so each spot has a different DNA sequence attached to it. And those are corresponding to genes we know. So we know that, you know, row 15, 
column one is gene X, and row 15, column two is gene Y. So we're going to see which of those light up, and it'll tell us what genes are on. So we can compare different tissues. So you could compare, um, like, the liver cells to the eye, crystalline cells, you know, the lens, and so you could see what genes were often on differently there. You can compare different time points in development, something like that, or in cancer progression to see what genes are turning off and on. And you could look at different conditions, for example, a disease tissue versus normal tissue and see how those are the same or different. Look at not drug-treated and drug-treated cells and see how that's different. So here's what the gene chip looks like. And the way you compare to um, if you're comparing two samples, is you label one sample all the um, mRNA you turn into DNA, cDNA. Then you label that with the red color, fluorescent probe. You take the DNA out of the other cell that you're interested in, let's say the drug-treated cell, and you label that um, RNA turned into DNA green. And then you wash the green and the red um, marked DNA over the, sh the chip. And wherever it's complementary, meaning it has the you know, complementary base sequence, it's going to bind the DNA that's attached to that spot. So this little spot has all these blue DNAs in it, and the red one in this case, whatever cell that came from, let's say it's the non-drug-treated cell, uh, binds there. The drug-treated cell is marked with green, and so that one has this gene being expressed. And sometimes both will be binding, so both are present, which means both genes are expressed. There are also cases where neither cell type, or neither the drug-treated or non-drug-treated, had that gene on, so they'd be blank. So you can see here, there's a red one, a green spot, a yellow spot, a black spot, and so that just tells you whatever gene you know is, is there is turned on only in the non-drug-treated cells. Whatever gene is here is only turned on in the drug-treated cells, and whatever gene is here is turned on in both cells and then neither cell. There are other videos I have of this too so that you can watch an actual animation of the process. They're put on the um, page that you came to this through as well. So that's the basics of transcription in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes. We also talked about the regulation of transcription in prokaryotes and eukaryotes as well as ways that we can visualize how much transcription is going on and where in the cell or embryo um, in the lab.